Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm welcome indeed to the University of Sussex and the Institute of Physics evening lecture. Um, very pleased tonight to have Joe Barstow come to visit. Um, I've known Joe for, for many years because um, her dad taught me physics at the University of Leicester, so um, she had a good upbringing, second generation physicist there. Um, she did her um, degree at the University of Cambridge and did her PhD at the University of Oxford. Um, she did her um, PhD in um, remote sensing of the clouds in Venus. And quite frankly, if you're looking at the clouds of Venus, remote sensing is the best way to do it. <laughs> but the techniques that Jo have learned in doing her PhD, she's now applying to other planets, other planets beyond our own solar system. And that's what Jo is going to be talking about tonight. So without further ado, thank you very much, Jo. Thank you very much, Darren, for asking me to come and give me the opportunity to talk to you tonight. I've got quite a broad title. I want to talk to you about atmospheres on other worlds. Um, and I'm going to start a little bit closer to home than exoplanets and talk a bit about our own solar system and our place in the solar system and how we understand that. And then I'm going to go on to talk about how we find other planets around other stars and then how we study their atmospheres and how we look at them. So first, I'm going to try and put the Earth in context for you um, and do a little bit of a comparison between what the Earth is like and the other planets in our solar system are like and think about perhaps why that is. Um, then I'll talk about how you detect extrasolar planets. Um, there are a few more ways than the ones I've listed of detecting them, but these are the most common and the most useful. Um, direct imaging, radial velocity and transits, and I'll explain what they all mean later. Um, and then I'll talk a bit about extrasolar planet atmospheres, why we would bother to look at their atmospheres, what sort of interesting information we can gain, um, how we can look at their atmospheres. As you can imagine, it's actually quite a difficult thing to do, to look at the atmosphere of a planet that's so, so, so far away, we can't even, most of the time, really even see the planet. All we can see is the light from the star, and that kind of washes out all the stuff coming from the planet itself. Um, the sorts of things we can find out, one of the things we can find out is um, biosignatures. Um, I'll talk a bit more about what those are later on. Um, I seem to have got some missing text in the bullet point. That should have said future and how exciting it is. So I'm going to talk a bit about the future telescopes, both in space and on the ground, that we're going to be able to use within the next few decades to hopefully... I guess the ultimate goal of all that I do is to try and look for evidence of life somewhere else um, outside of the Earth, outside of our own solar system. And those are the sorts of telescopes we're going to need to use to look for that. So what's our solar system like? It can broadly be divided into sort of two distinct groups of planets. We've got the four rocky planets, which are the inner planets. They're also called the terrestrial planets, which basically means they're like Earth. Um, these are Mercury, and um, that's the closest to the Sun and the smallest. Venus, which is the next, um, and that's roughly the same size as the Earth, um, obviously the Earth, and then Mars, which is about half the size of the Earth. And then as we go further out, we have four gaseous planets, which are much, much bigger. Um, these are Jupiter, the largest, Saturn, obviously famous for its beautiful rings, Uranus and Neptune. And just to give you an idea of scale, Neptune is about 30 times as far from the, Earth, from the Sun as the Earth is. Now... Just looking at those planets, the first thing we might want to know if we're thinking possibly about whether or not there could be life on these objects is their temperature. How hot are they? Um, the reason that we do that is life as we know it needs liquid water to survive. That may be quite a narrow definition of, the, of, of habitability, of the possibility of life being there, because life might be able to exist without liquid water in ways we can't imagine. But for now, we talk about the habitable zone as the region of a solar system or a stellar system where a planet can retain liquid water. It can have water in the liquid state. Um, it's not ice, it's not gas. So in our solar system, only the Earth is sitting there. Everything um, to the left of this, we would assume it's close to the sun, therefore it's hotter, therefore water is most likely to be gas, it's not going to be liquid. Anything to this side, that's going to be colder, probably going to exist in the form of ice and won't be liquid either. 
And we can assume this just based on the distance of the planets from the sun, because obviously most of their heat is obtained from sunlight. And the further away you go from the sun, the less sunlight you receive, so the less radiation from the sun you receive, the cooler you are. So if we were to sort of just put a rough guess of the temperature of some of these planets, we'd say Mercury is probably about 152 degrees C, Mars um, is about minus 53. Jupiter, even colder, minus 163. Neptune, really, really cold, about minus 230. So far, so good. Um, but then if we look in a bit more detail at um, Venus, we actually find that its surface temperature is significantly hotter than we would expect, just based on its distance from the sun. Its surface <coughs> temperature is about 462 degrees centigrade. Now, that's incredibly hot. Um, that's hotter than we would expect for Mercury, which tells you already there's got to be something else going on that isn't anything to do with how far it is from the sun. And that thing is its atmosphere. Venus's atmosphere is made of almost all carbon dioxide, um, which I'm sure you've all heard talked about a lot in terms of global warming on the Earth. This is um, the main greenhouse gas that we're pumping into the atmosphere that's responsible for global warming on Earth. Venus's atmosphere is almost all this gas, and not only that, Venus has nearly 100 times as much total gas in its atmosphere as the Earth does. So you can imagine an atmosphere that's 100 times the total mass of ours, and all of that is carbon dioxide. That's one heck of a greenhouse. So the reason that Venus is so incredibly hot is pretty much entirely due to what its atmosphere is made of. So what are the atmospheres of the other planets in the solar system made of then? If Venus is... is almost all CO2. The Earth, we know about, it's about 78% nitrogen and about 21% oxygen. That oxygen is obviously very important for us because it's what we breathe in. Mercury over here is pretty sad. It doesn't really have much of an atmosphere at all. And the reason for that is Mercury is tiny, so it's not very massive. So it doesn't have a particularly strong gravitational attraction to anything. And also, Mercury is really close to the sun. So whether a planet retains its atmosphere is sort of a competition, really, between things like its gravitational attraction, how much it's attracting its atmosphere to itself, and the solar wind, which is stripping it off. And Mercury completely loses out because it's too small, it's too close <coughs> to the sun. Um, the gas planets, they're all fairly uniform. They're all about 90% hydrogen, 10% helium, um, the lightest two molecules in the universe. Um, well, hydrogen is a molecule, that's just an atom, but they're all about the same roughly the same composition, a few other bits in there. Um, pretty much every gas giant, in fact, I think it's true, every gas giant that we've looked at so far, both in and out of our solar system, anything above a certain size is going to be made of mostly hydrogen and helium, just because there's so much of it. So we're left with, with Mars to look at. And that's interesting, because you'll notice that its composition is very, very, very similar to the atmosphere of Venus. And yet, Mars does not have a crazy greenhouse effect. Mars is pretty much the temperature we'd expect it to be based on its, different, its distance from the sun. So why is that? Well, basically, Mars just doesn't have that much atmosphere. So whereas Venus has about 100 times the amount of atmosphere, Mars has only about a tenth of the Earth's total atmospheric mass in its atmosphere. So even though it's mostly made of carbon dioxide, there just isn't enough of it to cause a significant greenhouse effect. So... I'm sure you can spot on there that the Earth, atmospherically speaking, is the, definitely the odd one out in our solar system. Um, we'll talk a bit more about why that is later and why that's interesting. Um, in terms of what a solar system looks like in terms of the orbits of the planets, this is what ours looks like. So up here, all of these scales in the top there, in terms of distance, are all relatively correct. So all those distances are correct. This is the inner solar system out to Mars. And then all of these vanish into this little space here, and the distances here are also correct with respect to each other out to Neptune. And what you'll notice is they're all quite, they all lie in quite a nice flat plane. Um, none of them are orbiting in some crazy orientation with respect to the others. They're all quite flat. They're all orbiting the sun in the same direction. And most of the planets are actually rotating on their own axes in the same direction as they're orbiting to, with a couple of exceptions. Venus is upside down. Uranus is on its side like this. No one really knows why that is. But by and large, things behave quite nicely. Everything goes in the same direction. It's all nice and flat. So if we were just to look at our solar system, um, then we might say, well, we know what a planetary system's like. They're all nice and flat. You get rocky planets in the middle that are closer to the star, and you get gas giant planets that are pretty cold further away from the star. 
Obviously, we wanted to test this theory, so for many, many decades, people were searching for planets orbiting other stars. In 1995, they found the first planet orbiting a star like our Sun, a main sequence star, um, called 51 Pegasi. Um, and since then, we found a heck of a lot more. Um, last time I checked the Exoplanet Archive, the count was 935 confirmed planets. Um, depending on who you ask, we might have got over 1,000 around now, but it depends a bit on how you count it. Um, largely due to really dedicated um, space missions, Coro and Kepler and um, SuperWASP, which is a very dedicated campaign of ground-based telescopes. They're all looking for these planets. Kepler has got, about, has got um, several thousand candidate planets in the pipeline, so they're things that might be planets, but we haven't done the requisite verification yet to be absolutely certain it's definitely a planet and not something else. So we've got a lot more things to look at now, and that means that we can really start to think about whether our solar system is normal or whether it's weird and what sorts of other planets are likely to form around stars. So obviously the first thing we want to do is look for these things. Um, this is probably the, the most intuitive method of looking. You'd say, well, it's easy. Let's just get a really big telescope and see if we can see something. Um, it turns out that's actually pretty difficult to do, although you can do it for some planets. Um, this planet, Beta Pictoris b, is one of the planets that we have been able to actually take a picture of with a telescope. Um, but it's, it's a lot more complicated than just point and shoot. So this little white dot here, that is Beta Pictoris b. That's the planet. You'll notice there's a load of rubbish in here that is kind of bumpy and wiggly stuff. This is where the star, Beta Pictoris, is in the image. But with the use of adaptive optic systems and, I think, coronography, so this, the star has been blocked out of this image. Because if you could have the star in the image too, you wouldn't see the planet because the star is just so much brighter. Um, this stuff out here is um, a circumstellar disk. So this is quite a young system. It still has a load of gas and dust around the star, which is probably condensing and forming planets at this point. Um, and the reason, again, that we can see the planet is because the planet's quite young. And because it's young, it's still quite warm. There's still quite a lot of internal heat that's generated by the formation of the planet. So we can do direct imaging of certain planets, but they have to be quite big planets. They have to be quite young, so they're still warm. And they have to be quite well separated from the star so that we can sort out the light that's coming from the star and the light that's coming from the planet. So we can do that for some. But um, if you imagine that we're looking for planets around all of these little tiny pinpricks, this is the Milky Way from, um, taken from um, the ESO site at Paranal. It's a very beautiful picture, but what we're looking for are little things like planets around stars like that. Now, you know just from looking at the sun in the daylight sky and looking, if you've ever seen a planet like Jupiter or Venus in the night sky, that the sun is a heck of a lot brighter than any of the planets and it's a heck of a lot bigger. So most of the time we've got the problem that we can't separate the light from the planet from the light from its parent star. They're too close or the planet's too faint. So we need to be a little bit clever. One of the methods that we use um, when we can't see the planet by itself is a method called radial velocities. Now, planets in the solar system, they orbit the sun. The reason that they're going in those nice, beautiful circles around the sun is because the sun is large, the sun has a lot of mass, the sun is gravitationally attracting all of those planets, and the planets are in orbit around the sun. Um, in exactly the same way, the moon and things that we put into space, like weather satellites, orbit the Earth due to the Earth's gravitational attraction on the moon and the satellites. But of course, that's a little bit of a simplistic way of looking at it, because we know that planets actually have some mass too. The sun is very, very much more massive than even Jupiter, which is the largest of the planets in the solar system, but Jupiter does have some mass too. And gravitational attraction is a two-way thing. So we might expect the presence of a planet like Jupiter, to take an example, to have some effect on the motion of the Sun too. And in fact, it does. So instead of Jupiter going around the Sun and the Sun just sitting there and not doing anything, what actually happens is both the Sun and Jupiter orbit a point that's still within the Sun, but it's not quite in the centre of the Sun, that we call the common centre of mass. So as Jupiter, this is obviously very speeded up, Jupiter's a lot slower than this, as Jupiter goes around the Sun, the Sun actually wobbles just a little bit. And believe it or not, we can measure that little tiny wobble of other stars and use that fact to infer that there's something orbiting the star that's making it have that periodic wobble. 
And the way that we do that is we monitor the light coming from the star. And if you picture light as a wave, um, it, the same thing happens with sound. Um, if you picture light as a wave, and you can imagine the star emitting light as a wave and it's coming towards you, then picture that wave getting squished. As the star comes towards you, that wave is going to get very slightly squashed. That means the wavelength of the light goes down. And what that corresponds to in terms of light that we can see is that the light will appear to be very, very, very slightly bluer than it would otherwise. And the converse happens when the star is moving away, the light gets stretched a bit, the wavelength increases, the light appears to be redder. And to give you an analogy, it's basically the same thing that happens every time a police car or a fire engine goes past you with a siren going. Um, if this is the wavelength of the sound that's emitted by the police car when it's stationary, then as it comes towards you, the sound get, the sound waves get squished, the pitch goes up, you perceive that, your ear perceives that as a higher sound. And then when it's gone past you, suddenly the pitch drops, and that's because the waves are then getting stretched out. So it's exactly the same thing. I've got a little movie here to show you um, how that works. So the way that we can we do this is not just to look at the continuum of light coming from a star, which, as you know, encompasses lots of colours, but there are chemicals, elements, or or molecules in the atmospheres of stars, of pretty much every star, that will absorb certain colours of light. And because we know what's in the atmosphere of the star, we know exactly which colours ought to be blocked out, ought to be absorbed. I'll set that running again so you can see it again. So by looking at those very specific bands, which are, are these black bands here, and seeing at what wavelength they occur, we can monitor a very, very, very small shift in the colour of the light coming from the star. And we can infer from that that something is orbiting the star. And we can also infer how massive the thing that's orbiting the star is. Because how massive it is affects how much the star wobbles, so it affects how much to the blue or how much to the red that light is shifted. So that's the radial velocity method. That's one indirect way of saying, yes, there is a planet orbiting this star. And that's how 51 Pegasi was found. Now, one that's slightly, probably slightly easier to envisage is the transit method. Um, did any of you see the transit of Venus last year? It was pretty early in the morning. Did anyone see 2004's transit? Yeah, a few more. I saw, I saw 2004, but not last year, because it was cloudy last year. So when Venus transits in front of the sun, you can see it passing in front of the sun because it's blocking out some of the light from the sun. Now, of course, if that was happening to a planet a long, long way away, if it was in such a configuration that it went in front of its star sometimes as we look at it, then it would also block out some of the light from the star. So if we monitor the total amount of light coming from a star over a long period of time, then as the planet crosses in front, what we see is the dip in the radiance or the total amount of light that we measure coming from the star. And that tells you there's a planet there. And it can also tell you the relative size of the planet with respect to its star, because obviously a bigger planet will block out more of the light. We can also observe something called a secondary transit when the planet goes behind the star, if the planet is bright enough. Because obviously, um, before the planet goes behind the star, you're measuring the combined light from the planet and from the star. But when it goes behind the star, suddenly you're only seeing the star, you're not seeing the planet at all. So by looking at the difference, we can also measure the light coming from the planet. So they're the main methods that we use to detect these planets. Um, and obviously, you can tell we're getting quite good at it now. We've got to about 1,000. That's pretty good going since 1995. And we're getting better at it as time goes by. So we can often work out various properties of these planets too. As I mentioned, from radial velocity, you can work out the mass of the planet, how heavy it is. From the transit method, you can work out how big it is relative to its star. You can work out its physical size. From both of those methods, you can work out how long it takes to orbit its star once. And if you know how big the star is, that can tell, if you know properties of the star as well, that can also tell you um, how far away it is from the star. And that will also give you, as we talked about before, an approximate temperature for the planet. That will tell you if we think it's likely to be in the habitable zone of that star. Now, that also depends on the type of star, because um, different stars uh, of different sizes 
and they also have different temperatures, which means they emit different amounts of light, which means they can heat planets up to a different degree. So our star um, is what we call a G-type star. It's a yellow-colored star, and it's kind of a, a sort of middling temperature star um, for the kinds of stars that we often observe with planets around it. And the habitable zone is basically slap bang where the Earth is. Venus is too hot, Mars is too cold. If we took um, that middle bit of our solar system and instead of putting it around the sun, we stuck it around a redder star um, that we tend to call an M-type star, then that's a much cooler star. So the habitable zone would move in and the Earth would now be too cold, but Venus, without a massive CO2 greenhouse, if it didn't have that, might actually be habitable. If instead we stuck it around a bluer star, an F-type star that's hotter, then the habitable zone goes outwards. So Mars would then be habitable and the Earth would be too hot. And we are starting to find um, some planets that might look a little bit like the Earth. Um, so there are some discoveries in the last couple of years from Kepler of planets like Kepler-20e and Kepler-20f. We don't know how massive these planets are um, because the star is too faint for us to do a radial velocity measurement, but we know how big they are relative to the star. And based on their size, we'd guess they're going to be rocky because they're roughly the same size as Venus and the Earth. So we're starting to find these, but they're a little bit too hot. These are quite close to the star, so they're not habitable, but they are rocky. We're also starting to find planets like this one, Kepler-22b, which is um, about two or three times the size of the Earth. Um, that is actually in the habitable zone of its star. But it's a bit of a weird case because it's in between the Earth and, v and, uh, sorry, in between the Earth and Neptune in size. There's nothing in our solar system that's like it. So we don't actually really know what we expect it to be made of. We don't know if we expect it to be a little rocky thing with a really puffy atmosphere or if we expect it to be kind of all atmosphere but maybe made of something like water vapor, a sort of steam planet or a water world. So these objects are really, really interesting because we, we actually just don't know what we expect them to be made of. Um, but this is one example of finding something in the habitable zone. So we're starting to get towards a rocky planet in the habitable zone but it's pretty difficult. Um, this is quite an old plot um, when there weren't so many known nearby exoplanets, but it shows something that I think is really quite important um, to note when we're talking about this kind of measurement. Um, this on the x-axis here is the, what is called quite fancily the orbital semi-major axis. What that basically means is how far away the planet is from the star in astronomical units. One astronomical unit, that's the distance between the Earth and the Sun. So, most of these planets, I can tell you, are Jupiter-sized things. Um, they're gas giant planets. And if you look, how many of those are even closer to their star than the Earth is to the Sun? And yet they're gas giants. Now, that possibly tells you that our solar system is not that usual because we're seeing all of these systems with big gas giant planets really close to their stars. But what it also tells you is that it's actually really difficult to detect planets that are like the ones in our solar system using these methods because a planet that's really close to its star is much more likely to transit its star from our viewpoint. If a planet's big, it's much more likely to produce a transit that we can measure. If it's big and close to its star, it's going to produce a much more obvious wobble in the star, so the radial velocity signature is going to be a lot bigger. So all of these detection methods, apart from the direct imaging method, which has its own biases, we discussed this earlier, are really biased towards big planets that are hot and really close to their stars. So that's why it's difficult to look for something that's like the Earth, which isn't very hot, it's pretty small, and it's not, in, at least in these terms, if you look again how close some of these are, it's not that close to the Sun. So detection bias makes it quite difficult to find a real Earth analog planet. But we're trying, and we're getting a lot closer. So now let's talk about what we can find out from looking at the atmospheres of these objects. Now, you may be sitting there thinking, good grief, these things are really hard to even detect. How on earth can we look at their atmospheres? Um, you'd be right. It's very, very difficult, but I'm going to explain how. But first, why do we want to? Well, if we're looking for life, we want to know how we would be able to tell that a planet that far away might host life. Um, and they're not likely to be broadcasting messages at us saying, hey, we're here, look at us. Um, even we're not doing that, even inadvertently. You might think that um, because we use so much 
radio wavelengths and things like that for broadcasting, that we're broadcasting, I'm a celebrity, get me out of here, across the universe. Actually, we're not really anymore. We've got a lot better at channeling those broadcasts so they don't escape because it's a lot more efficient to do it that way. So we're not really that obvious to somebody looking in from the outside anymore. So if someone looked at the Earth, how would they be able to, would they be able to even guess that there's life here? Would they know? And I think they would. And the reason for that is what we tend to refer to as disequilibrium. Our atmosphere is not how we would expect it to be if we just stuck a bunch of chemicals in the atmosphere and let it do its thing. And the reason for that is that there is life on Earth and that is perturbing the equilibrium state of the atmosphere. If you didn't have life and you stuck an atmosphere with a bit of methane and loads of oxygen, um, just stuck it there, you, you'd end up with a lot of water and CO2. You wouldn't keep the oxygen. Oxygen's really reactive. But the reason we have so much oxygen is that we have plant life, we have obviously animal life as well, but plants photosynthesize, they're providing a constant source of oxygen and that's what's keeping the level of oxygen in our atmosphere so high. It's pretty useful for us, but it would also be useful for somebody looking from the outside because they'd look at that amount of oxygen and go, well, that's weird, that shouldn't be there. That indicates that there's something that's changing the atmosphere and that something is quite likely to be something like life. So that's one reason. Also, we talked about Venus and its massive CO2 <coughs> greenhouse. What an atmosphere is made of affects quite strongly its chance of having life because it affects its temperature and it affects the habitability of the planet. So that's another reason we want to look at atmospheres because we want to look at some of these rocky planets, if we, when we find them, rocky planets that are in the habitable zone based on their distance from the star, we want to look at them and say, well, are they really habitable or have they got an atmosphere like that of Venus that makes it just impossible for any life to exist? And the way to do that is we use a technique called spectroscopy. And what that basically means is looking at light over lots and lots of different wavelengths and lots of different colours. So it's a similar technique actually to that that we use to find the planets using the radial velocity method, using the stellar wobble. So we look at light basically from the ultraviolet all the way through the visible part of the spectrum through to the infrared. And the reason that we want to look at that kind of light is that stars emit most of their light in the visible. So if we're looking for the signature where a planet crosses in front of its star, then we're going to have most of the photons, light particles, most of the light is going to come from the visible. If we actually want to look at the light emitted by planets themselves, then we want to look in the infrared, because that's the wavelength of light that's emitted by things that are the temperature of, say, the human body, or in fact, most planets like the Earth. Um, you know that because if you want a lot of um, night vision technology uses the thermal infrared to look for heat signatures of people and animals and things like that. So that's why we want to look in the infrared. Another good reason for looking in the infrared is that most of the gases like water vapor, for example, or methane that we're interested in, they mostly absorb light in the infrared too. So if we want to look for signatures of absorption due to gases, we want to look in the infrared. Um, and also, um, this is probably not such a big deal for life, but it's something I'm quite interested in. I quite find clouds on other planets quite fascinating. They scatter light depending on the size of the droplets or particles, anything from the UV through to the infrared. So that's why we want to look at this, these wavelengths of light. And if we have the whole thing in one go, that whole spectrum, that can tell us a great deal about the atmosphere of a planet. So we can't even see these things. How on earth do we get a spectrum of their atmospheres? We need to be a bit clever. Um, we need to use the properties of the transit to do that. So I have a hypothetical planet here. It's orbiting a nice yellow star. Um, it's red um, because I decided it was red. But I'm going to tell you that its atmosphere is really, really absorbing in red light. So there's some chemical in its atmosphere that absorbs red light very, very efficiently. And only red light, nothing else. If we were to view this planet as it transits using a blue filter, then the atmosphere would actually be transparent to blue light because it's not being absorbed. So the light coming from the star would be stopped by the solid bit of the planet, but it would get through the atmosphere, no problem. If, on the other hand, we're going to look at it using a red filter, then we wouldn't see any light coming through the atmosphere because the atmosphere is, is absorbing it all. So if you imagine that um, looking down on the system and the light's going through the atmosphere, if it's blue, but if it's red, it's getting stopped. What does that look like if we're observing a transit this time in blue light and in red light? Well, this is what it looks like. 
you notice that the transit in red light is significantly deeper than the transit in blue light. What it means is that the planet looks like it's bigger if you look at it in red light because the atmosphere is absorbing light. So the bit of the star that's being obscured is actually bigger if you look at it in red light because the atmosphere is absorbing as well as the solid body of the planet. The atmosphere is blocking the red light. So if you imagine doing this over lots and lots of different colours and wavelengths of light, and if, for example, we know that a particular chemical is very, very absorbing in this particular wavelength of red light, if we saw that sort of signature, we'd, see, we'd say, oh, look, we've detected this molecule in this planet's atmosphere because the planet appears bigger in the wavelength where we expect that molecule to absorb. So that's really, I think that's really quite a neat way of doing this. Um, we can also look at the light that's being emitted by the planet itself um, over all different colours by looking at the secondary transit again, which is where the planet goes behind the star and is eclipsed. So if you think about this scenario, just before the planet's eclipsed, you can see a combination of the light coming from the planet and coming from the star. But here, when the planet's behind the star, all you're seeing is light from the star. So by looking at the difference between these two scenarios, we can actually sort out that little tiny bit of light that's being emitted by the planet, and we can actually get a spectrum of light coming from the planet too. And these are some examples of measurements and some, and some models as well um, for a particular planet. This is a planet and that's known by the telephone number HD 189733B. Um, for the, any of you read XKCD, it's also known as permadeath. Um, some of you might get that joke and some of you might not. Um, it doesn't have a, an official name yet apart from its telephone number, um, but we're hoping that maybe it will one day. So this is the primary transit spectrum. So this is where the planet's going in front of the star. So what you're measuring is the apparent size of the planet relative to the size of the star. Um, this um, wavelength is about one micron. So over here is visible and UV light. Over here is all the infrared. Um, you'll notice the planet is much, much bigger in the visible, apparently, than it is in the infrared. It's also much, much bigger than we expected it to be in the visible, um, because these are the sorts of models we were expecting. And that's probably an indicator that there's some sort of cloud or haze that's high up in the atmosphere of this planet that's scattering away all of the visible light and stopping it from getting through the atmosphere. So we've actually learned from this that this planet has clouds, which I think is quite impressive. Um, over here is the thermal emission spectrum. Um, the thick line is a model. Um, there is, you see these points here in certain parts of the spectrum. So this is over in the infrared again. Um, and this is telling you a bit about what molecules are in the planet's atmosphere, but it's also telling you how hot the planet really is because it tells you the amount of light that's being emitted by the planet tells you what the temperature is of the planet, of the thing that's doing the emitting. So you can see that from doing these observations, we can actually gain a really huge amount of information about something that we can't even actually see, even with a big telescope, which I think is really, really impressive. So this is the way that we work out what the atmospheres of these planets are made of. Um, but I showed you that, and I explained how it's done, and maybe it all sounds very simple. Of course, it's, it's not actually simple. It's really quite incredibly tricky. Um, the main reason that it's so tricky is that the signals we are looking at are absolutely minuscule. Even for a reasonably big planet, like a Jupiter-sized planet orbiting a sun, the amount that the, uh, that the light from the sun would go down as the planet crosses it would, is about 1%. So the size of the transit is about 1%. The variation in the apparent size of the planet between a band where the atmosphere is not absorbing and a band where it is, is about 1% of 1%. So it's about, it's 1% of the transit signal. So what we're looking at is a signal of about 1 in 10,000, even for quite a big planet with quite a big puffy atmosphere. That's a really, really, really tiny signal. So to do that, you need incredibly stable optics on your telescope. You need the temperature of the detector to be very, very stable and not to change very much. You need the atmosphere of the Earth to not get in the way, which is why we'd like to go to space to make this kind of measurement. So it's really very tricky. One of the other things that makes it really tricky are star spots. Um, so you probably know, you may know, that the Sun um, has an 11-year cycle of activity. And when it's very, very active, you get these dark regions on the Sun that are called star spots. 
so, or sunspots, and they're regions of the sun's surface that are colder than the rest of the surface. And that means that the light that they emit, their spectrum, is also quite different from the rest of the surface. So even without planets crossing in front of it, if you measured the amount of light coming from our sun over a long period of time, it wouldn't actually be constant, it would go up and down. So given that we're measuring tiny changes in the amount of light coming from a star, well, actually, that can change anyway. That can change anyway because the star is active. So that can also cause real problems with this measurement. And of course, this is a heck of a lot easier to do for big hot planets than it is for little cold ones. And one of the main reasons for that is that a planet like Jupiter has a very puffy atmosphere. Its atmosphere is physically quite big, um, and that's because its atmosphere is made of a gas that's quite light. If you have a, a version of Jupiter that's really, really close to its star, like one of these hot Jupiters, it's also very hot, and that makes it even puffier. So it's really, really easy to see these signatures. If you did it for something like Venus, even though it has a load of atmosphere and it's very, very massive, the atmosphere is quite condensed in space because it's made of quite a heavy gas. Carbon dioxide is quite a heavy gas. So it's quite flat. So actually, you wouldn't see a very big signal from an atmosphere like that of Venus because it's, it's quite compressed. So it's a lot easier to do this for a hot Jupiter than it is for something like the Earth, which makes it a little bit tricky. Um, but we're still going to try. And there are other ways that we could do this for Earth-like planets that might be easier that are being explored at the moment. Um, the other thing um, is something that we tend to refer to in sort of atmospheric physicist speak jargon as degeneracy. And that's basically saying that we've, we've got a lovely spectrum from a hot Jupiter, and it's quite good because it's a hot Jupiter and it's easy to do. But we still don't know which of our models is the right one, because if we make lots of different models, they fit the spectrum equally well, so we can't really distinguish between them. Um, this is an example. Um, this isn't actually for a hot Jupiter. This is for um, a planet that ha goes by the lovely name Gliese 1214b. It's a planet that's about two and a half times the size of the Earth, and it's orbiting quite a small red star. And we've measured its spectrum pretty well, but its spectrum's quite flat. And that means there's not very much information in it. So we can rule out this particular model, um, the red model. That's a cloud-free atmosphere that's mostly made of hydrogen and helium. But all of these models, these grey models, which are hydrogen helium atmospheres with cloud in, and this blue one, which is an atmosphere with loads of water vapour, they all fit the data equally well, the data that we have so far. So that makes it really difficult. Um, you can also see here, I've marked on the locations of the absorption features for things like water vapour and methane. So this bump here, where the planet appears to be really quite big, that's a feature that's due to methane. That's due to methane absorbing in the planet's atmosphere. Um, this one here would be due to water vapour. This one, again, methane. These are all models. Um, the data for this planet look um, have quite big error bars on it, um, and they don't look anything like as pretty. Um, we're hoping to get spectra that look like this, or at least a lot more like this, over the next 10, 20 years or so. So lastly, I want to talk about biosignatures. Um, we can go back a little bit to when I've said that one of the things that marks the Earth out as having life is the presence of oxygen in its atmosphere. But it doesn't just have to be oxygen that's an indicator of life. A biosignature is any gas that's present in an atmosphere that gives you some evidence for life, either past or current. So oxygen is one. It's an obvious one. Another one that you might see from looking at the Earth is ozone. Ozone, instead of being two oxygen atoms stuck together, is three oxygen atoms stuck together. Um, that, but it's a chemical product of oxygen. So there wouldn't be that much ozone in our atmosphere if there wasn't already a lot of oxygen. So that's a biosignature. Methane is also a biosignature. It's obviously not a signature of, of people, but it's a signature of certain kinds of bacterial life which produce methane as part of their life cycle. So methane is something, if we saw far more methane than we would expect to be in chemical equilibrium in an atmosphere, then we might also attribute that to life. Um, that's why a lot of people are looking quite extensively for methane signatures in the Martian atmosphere, because that might have been evidence for bacterial life on Mars. They haven't found it yet, at least not in the right kind of quantity. Um, there are other chemicals as well. There are 
various hydrocarbon molecules, which are molecules that are made up of long chains of carbon with hydrogen atoms stuck to it, and also sulfur compounds like this one. This is an oxygen, a carbon, and a sulfur. It's called carbonyl sulfide. That's also a chemical that can be produced by life and is not that likely to be produced any other way. And actually, these are, in a way, some of the best ones that we can look at because they're much more likely to be produced by life than something else. We want chemical signatures that don't have what we call false positives. We don't want to look for a chemical signature that could be produced by another mechanism that has nothing to do with life because that actually wouldn't tell us very much. Unfortunately, these key ones that I've talked about that are probably the most obvious, oxygen and methane, they're also quite nice and easy to detect because they have quite big spectral features, can both be produced by things that have nothing to do with life. If you have um, a sort of water world scenario planet that has a lot of water vapour in its atmosphere, and it's losing its atmosphere because it's quite close to the, because it's it's too close to the star, or because it doesn't have a magnetic field, so the stellar wind is directly in contact with the top of the atmosphere, and its atmosphere is being stripped away for whatever reason. It's losing its atmosphere. You get water vapour decomposing at the top of the atmosphere. It goes to hydrogen and oxygen. Now, I'm sure you probably all know that hydrogen is the lightest element, so H2 is the lightest molecule there is. Oxygen is quite a bit heavier, so hydrogen is preferentially lost from the top of the atmosphere. That will go much, much faster than the oxygen. So what you can be left with is the top of the atmosphere with a load of oxygen. And that's happened, nothing to do with life, it's just happened because water's broken up and the hydrogen's gone first. Um, also, methane can be produced um, by other kinds of chemical reaction. If um, you've ever seen pictures of these, those wonderful black smokers, which are sort of underwater volcanic vents, methane is produced by, I think it's a reaction between some of the rock and chemicals in, in the black smoker with the, with the seawater. You get a lot of methane present in black smokers. So there are other mechanisms also for producing methane. So it's a bit of a tricky thing to do, um, but we might want to look for some of the slightly more obscure chemical signatures of life if we want to be really certain that what we're looking at is life and not a black smoker, for example. But what I really want to leave you with is a message that the future of this work is, is really, really exciting because, I mean, in, in less than 20 years, we've come a very, very long way. We've come from not even knowing there are other planets around sun, stars like our sun to knowing of almost a thousand and for maybe about 10 or 20, we've actually studied their atmospheres as well, and we know quite a lot about them. And we're going even further. So there are three um, particular surveys that are going to be looking for more of these planets um, over the next 10 to 20 years. Um, TESS is a NASA mission um, that's going to launch in 2017, and that's looking for planets around nearby bright stars. So that will hopefully be able to find smaller planets because if you have a brighter star, you have more light. That means more photons. That means that the amount of signal you have when you're looking at a transit is higher compared with the noise that you have. So bright stars are good. We've also got NGTS, which is the Next Generation Transit Survey. That's a ground-based survey. That's a network of small telescopes that's going to be um, near the ESO site at Paranal in Chile. And that's looking specifically for planets that are orbiting some of those smaller, cooler stars. And that's also really good for looking at smaller planets, because obviously if you have a smaller star, then the percentage change in the light coming from the star for even quite a small planet will be higher than it would be for a bigger star. So the, you just get a favourable planet-to-star size ratio. So that's another survey. And there's also this one called CHAOPS, which is um, an, a European Space Agency small mission. And that is not looking for new planets as such, but it's, going, it's looking for transits of planets that have already been found using the radial velocity method. So planets that we know the mass for, but we don't know the physical size because we haven't seen a transit yet. And we've also got new things for looking at the atmospheres of these planets. Um, one of these is the European Extremely Large Telescope. We're really imaginative at naming things. It is an extremely large telescope. Um, the main mirror is going to be 39 metres across, which is really pretty huge. And that's going to be also in Chile. Um, I think first light is around 2020 or 2022. 
So we should start getting some information from that in the early 2020s. Um, we've also got this thing going up into space. This is a, this is a mostly NASA mission, although um, there's some ESA collaboration as well. Um, in fact, um, one of the instruments, um, parts of the instrument, MIRI, were um, built and designed at Rutherford Appleton Laboratories near Oxford. So we've got some investment in this mission. That's going to launch around 2017, 2018. Um, it's got a 25 square meter approx primary mirror, which is actually which is absolutely huge for a space telescope. Getting something that big into space is really quite difficult and costs a lot of money. It's a segmented mirror, which means that it could easily be easily be put together. I don't know if you can see some of the segments there. So both of these telescopes are going to be basically collecting a lot of light across the bit of the spectrum I said we were interested in, from the visible, particularly through to the infrared. So we can use both of these, hopefully, to do the kind of spectroscopy that I was talking about earlier. But the problem with this one is it's sitting <coughs> on the ground, so there are bits of that spectrum that we can't access because the Earth's atmosphere is absorbing all the light in those bits of the spectrum. So nothing's coming through. We can't see all of that spectrum. This is going up into space, um, but it's only going to measure the spectrum in bits. So you can have a visible bit one day, and an infrared bit the next day. But if you remember, I said that one of the biggest problems we have is that stars are active, so the amount of light coming from a star can change independent of whether anything's transiting. So that means it's really difficult to stitch together a measurement that was taken on one day with a measurement taken two weeks later. So they'll be very, very good, but there are some limitations. Sorry, this is a little bit of a sales pitch um, because this is the mission that I'm particularly interested in because I've been um, doing some work on the proposal for it. Um, this is a mission that's called ECHO. It's being proposed to ESA at the moment. Um, it is up for selection in February. It's in competition with four other missions to do different things. Um, I really, really hope that this will get selected. If it does, it will launch around 2024. And what it will be is a one and a half meter space telescope um, that will sit um, at what we call the Lagrange 2 point, which is the stable point within the Earth-Sun system that means it's always being shadowed by the, it being shaded by the Earth from the Sun, so it's not in direct sunlight. That means it can keep a nice stable temperature and it, me it means that it's not going to have too much noise and fluctuations within the instrument. It will take spectra of exoplanets um, from 0.4 microns, which is um, just blue of the blue end of the visible spectrum, um, out to 16 microns, which is into the mid-infrared. And it will it's to be dedicated to observing trans transiting ex exoplanets. So it will be looking at probably some of these planets that are being discovered by the earlier missions I mentioned, like TESS, and looking at their atmospheres. And um, these are some simulations that I made um, to show what sort of information we'll be getting. So these black points um, are a primary transit spectrum of a Jupiter-sized planet, but a hot Jupiter, um, orbiting a sun-like star. So this is the apparent change in the relative size of the planet to the star that you would see. So these, these bumps are the absorption features. This big bump over here is um, an absorption feature due to CO2, for example. And this is what we would see when the planet is eclipsed by the star. So this is the relative amount of flux of light flux from the planet to the flux from the star. So you can see that that gets much higher as you go to the infrared because the planet's emitting most of its light in the infrared, but the star's emitting most of its light in the visible. Um, you can probably see, if you remember what the, the plots were like that I showed you for some of the planets we've seen so far, that these data are, have much more extensive coverage um, than, we can get, than we have so far because at the moment, we're still trying to stitch together little bits of data taken with one, with one instrument on the Hubble Space Telescope with an instrument on the ground, and we're trying to put all those together, and it's very, very difficult. So this would be an absolutely enormous step and would enable us to take that whole spectrum in one go, which really minimizes the problems we have with stellar activity. So um, keep your fingers crossed for, for me and the rest of the people on this team in February who are really hoping that this gets selected and we can start developing it, and we'll have 10 years to... to and develop our models and our other techniques to make this a really successful mission if it goes ahead. So to summarize, um, if we want to find ET, studying the atmospheres of planets is really, really important. 
Um, we're starting to find planets that are similar in size to the Earth. I, rec I reckon my personal estimate is we're probably still about 30 to 40 years away from being able to get a beautiful spectrum like the one that I just showed you for a true Earth analogue planet, an Earth-like, earth size planet that's about the same temperature. Because it's very, very small, it's very, very difficult, but I think we'll do it, and I think we'll probably do it in the lifetime of most of the people in this room, which would be very cool. And we can study the atmospheres when they transit their parent stars, um, which is tricky, um, challenging. It's a very, very small signal, one part in 10,000, but we're getting much better at it, and the new technology that's becoming available is going to make it a lot easier. So we need large telescopes on the ground, or we need telescopes in space. Basically, the larger the better. The more light that we can get, the better. But we're certainly on the right track. Um, it's a really exciting time to be doing my job. Um, and I'd just like to leave you with this. It's a little bit out of date now. This was um, 786, was June last year, June 2012. But I just love this, um, this little cartoon that was um, done by Randall Munro, who's the uh, author of the webcomic XKCD. Because this little grey box here shows you the schematic of the solar system planets. So you, can only, you can't even see Earth. You can see Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune in the box. Um, I think that really puts us in our place with respect to the rest of the universe and the rest of the worlds out there in rather a beautiful way. And the, this number is increasing pretty much every day at the moment. So I'll leave you with that, and I'll take questions. Thank you. Well, thank you, Joe. A, a wonderful talk, and, and I love this area of research. It, it's amazing. 20 years ago, we didn't know planets existed beyond our solar system. And today, we're finding a new planet every few days. And those planets are, are so individual and so um, fascinating in their own right. Does um, anyone have any questions for Dr. Barstow? Yes. How would it help us? Yeah. It would help us to perhaps to think about um, maybe how we evolved and how we came to be here. I think one of the most interesting things about the question is that we, don't, we still don't really know if we're the only example of life in the universe. And I think that getting a bit of a better handle on that would be quite profound um, in terms of how we understand ourselves. Would it help us practically? Um, I guess you mean, could we ever go there and exploit it? Um, it's pretty difficult. Uh, I think until we invent the kind of um, travel capabilities that you see on Star Trek, it's not going to be of a, gr a great deal of practical use. But I have to say that studying the atmospheres of planets in our solar system and outside, I think that getting a better understanding of how atmospheres work should help us to think about how we're treating our own and think about climate change. Because it is a very difficult system to understand. Having the opportunity to look at other planets that have evolved differently does give us a better handle on what's happening to our atmosphere and how it's changing. It strikes me when, when you read about how life developed on Earth. It's such a complex matter of tectonic plates, of the oxygen atmosphere evolving, of recycling of And the fact that the, the centre of the Earth is still producing heat, yes. it isn't just the sun. So even if you did find a planet that was exactly the size of the Earth, exactly the same distance from a similar star, orbiting so that you have a reasonable blend of seasons rather yes. than orbiting faster or slower, you've got an awful lot to do even if you find a oh, I agree. planet. Yes, you do, um, which is why I think it's interesting to look not just for planets that we think might have life, but really try and target trying to detect life remotely as well. Because I, you're absolutely right. I don't think that for a minute that we should say, if we find a planet like you've described, we cannot be in any way confident that there's life or even likely to be life. Yeah, I, and I think that actually... That's starting to come down to almost a personal philosophy thing. I think if you ask different people, they would tell you different numbers about whether they think that's likely or not. 
it's a very complex problem and a lot of people are devoting their time actually purely to working out the mathematics of that kind of problem which is something that I don't know a great deal about, but I've heard some very optimistic arguments and some really incredibly pessimistic ones as well who think that we're all, all by ourselves. And I'm not sure I would want to stake, put any money on who's right, to be honest. It's very, very difficult. Yeah, I'm a humble, retired engineer. So well, I say might sound a bit ignorant, but you gave something away right at the beginning. You said, in looking for life elsewhere, you assume water and so on. Yes. Is it not conceivable that there are totally different Oh, absolutely. Of life. Um, I have imagined this, these creatures whose bones are made of sulfur who swim in methane, or whatever, you know. Yes. Uh, that's an ignorant one, but um, is, it, is it not a, a massive assumption to assume life is like our life? You're right, it's a huge assumption. But the, I think the reason that we make it is because we have to start somewhere. And the easiest place to start, to look, is for things that are like us. Because, because then you, you're in the realm of, as you say, you could imagine almost anything. It's very, very difficult to know what we'd look for, for lots of these things. But I agree, I absolutely agree with you that using that as the definition of habitable is a very narrow definition of habitable. Unfortunately, it's sort of, it's the only starting point we've got, really, because it's all that we know. Yeah, I, so I can ask a question that, um it is a marvellous lecture, by the way. Um, uh, one is absolutely supportive of, of trying to understand what's going on. But looking for life as we know it seems to be one odd phenomenon to look for. There are all sorts of other things you'd be looking for. Oh, we if are looking. Life, of course, it would be great for yes. all night. Yes. Um, <laughs> but um, why is that such an important thing compared with all the other phenomena you could be looking oh, for? Oh, it's, it's, it's not the only thing that, that we would look for. Um, it tends, as you say, it's the headline-grabbing thing that we yeah, would look for. Yeah. Um, I personally find the concept of clouds on these planets incredibly fascinating, um, particularly the hot Jupiters, because um, I showed you an example where we're pretty sure that that signature is clouds. That's amazingly exciting. In fact, we've actually measured the colour of that planet, the visible colour, by looking at the reflected light as it disappears behind the, its star, we've looked at the spectrum of its reflected light and it's blue. We know it would be blue if we could look at it. It's clouds, but what are they made of? They're probably, they're the most that we're talking, are they silicates? They could be aluminium oxide, they could be iron, because this thing is really, really hot. This is, thousand, this is over 1,000 degrees centigrade, it's about 1,500 degrees centigrade or hotter. So actually, you're right, there's a lot more that's interesting. As a, as a, as a scientist working on it, I find, probably at the moment, I like the clouds. I think they're really fascinating because they're so far beyond what, what we know. How, yeah. how far away is the nearest planet? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so there is a possible planet around, which I'm still not sure I believe in entirely, um, around Alpha Centauri B, which and I can't remember exactly how far away that is. I think Proxima Centauri is about four light years, so it's a little further than that. If that, and it would be the nearest planet if, if it actually exists, but it's, um, it's been detected supposedly by the radial velocity method, um, but it's a very noisy radial velocity measurement. It, I haven't yet been co totally convinced that it's really there. Um, beyond that, I'm not really sure which would be the closest. Yes? Um, when, de when dealing with the radial velocity idea, um, you're looking at the size of the planets on the wobble of the star. Yes. Um, how would you like move that to like a binary system? Because, of course, you have the idea of planets around binary systems. Which oh, that's a really good question. Um, you have to sort of separate the components, if you like. Um, so people who, study, who do that kind of detection, you can make some really quite complicated, sophisticated models of the dynamics of a system and work out what you think that you would see. Um, so you, you, could, you can detect a planet around a binary system like that, but you have to model all of the components. So you'd have to model the components of the binary stars. Of course, with the binary stars, because they're both stars, you've got, a better you've got a better chance of being able to detect the light components coming from each star too. So you probably have a better handle on what's there. You might already know about the binary, for example. Um, but people have also tried to detect um, multiple radial velocity signatures within a, within a single system. So you don't even just do it for single planets. So you can do it, 
but it's a lot obviously becomes a lot more complicated. What I should perhaps have said is when you get a mass of a planet from radial velocity, unless you also have the transit, so you know the inclination of the system, you can only ever measure the minimum mass of the planet because obviously if you can imagine the system's tilted, the only component of the star's motion you can measure is this way. So if it's actually going like this, you don't see all of its motion. You only see this bit of its motion. So you can get the minimum mass of a planet would be if it was really like this and you were seeing all of the star's motion. But if you're actually seeing only a bit of the star's motion, then the planet could be more massive than you think it is. But if it's transiting, then you know what the inclination of the system is, so you could correct for that. Yes? Um, I imagine it's also possible for life to exist on moons. Yes. That, I mean, that give you a, a large number more extra. Um, oh, yeah, there is certainly speculation about that. Um, detecting moons, I don't think anyone has yet definitively detected a moon around an exoplanet, but um, there have been papers that I've read discussing how one might go about doing that and what sort of signature we'd expect in the transit, for example. Um, I think if you want to look for life on moons, you're probably better investing a bit of time at the moment in our solar system and looking at the ice moons like Europa, for example, which is one of Jupiter's moons, or Enceladus or Titan, which I'm still not sure I think it's terribly likely there's life on any of those, but I think it's, it's probably a better shot than Mars, actually, I would have said, that there might be some form of bacterial life. So I would probably look to our solar system and its moons first, but you're right, um, there is a definitely a chance there could be life on moons. Yes? Of the 900 plus planets we now have as suspect, what proportion of those actually are in the habitable zone? Not that many. I, I'm not sure exactly what the number is, but very few for the reasons that I talked about earlier because of detection bias. It's easier to detect them if they're close to the star. So not very many, but um, because these biases are becoming better understood, um, the Kepler mission in particular, because it's detected so many of these, and they, and they un think they understand those biases quite well, they can come up with an expected real percentage of habitable zone planets by extrapolating. And I think that's actually relatively, I can't remember what that is, but I think it is, it's a lot higher than the sample that we can see, for example. Yes? Because if you that's obviously, if you're close to it in the way that we are when we see Venus transit, that becomes a problem. At the distance you are from the system, the angles are so very, very, very small that that doesn't matter at all. The distance, the distance the planet is from the star has basically no effect because you're so far away from the whole thing. So the only thing that really matters is the size of the planet. If one has two stars in a close binary system, then the temperature of the two stars is not uniform. You get yep. all sorts of yeah. strange shapes. If you've got a hot Jupiter quite close into a star, then the side of the star facing the hot Jupiter is not going to be the same as the side on the opposite side. It's not quite as dramatic as it would be for a binary. No, um, I understand that. Yeah. But uh, you're looking at very small, I mean, the part in terms of the four effects. I mean, I can't do the sums in my head. But I just so you're talking about, I think the difference is, pr you, you would have to, you do take into account limb darkening of the star in the models when we, when we fit these models to the transit shape. So you're not assuming that the star is a perfect disk when you do this. Um, I think that, I would think that the, the degree of distortion is smaller than we would be interested in for the hot Jupiter. It is a lot smaller than a binary star. It's significantly smaller. But you do, you're much more likely to get strange effects with the planet, um, which we have. We are starting to see evidence that the planets are not even symmetrical, that they have some weird tails and they're being distorted, and some of them are even breaking up by the looks of it. That's a good point, though. That's a good point, though. I the star is not going to be, if you've got something a few times the mass of Jupiter in a few day orbit around as a, an M dwarf. Oh, around an M dwarf, I think, yes. You don't tend to see hot Jupiter-sized things around M dwarfs. You tend to see them mostly around G-type stars or larger stars. So the ratios, the ratios are much smaller. I'm not completely sure why that is, um, but they are much, much rarer. We don't think we really know of. We, there are very few around an M dwarf. When you look at the uh, line spectra of uh, planets when they're transiting, 
Um, if you had a very eccentric orbit of the planet, yep. would that not affect the, the reading you get? You would know if you can work out how eccentric an orbit is by looking at the time between the, to some extent, by looking at the time between the transit and the eclipse, and then the time between the eclipse and transit. It wouldn't affect the spectrum that you observe. It affects the way that you fit um, the transit model. So the model that tells you what the shape of the, the transit is as the planet crosses and what time it occurs. So you do need to be aware of that sort of thing when you're modeling a transit. But once you've modeled the transit, if you've done so correctly, it shouldn't affect the spectrum that you see particularly. It might have, it, it would certainly affect um, the, the weather, I suppose, or the dynamics on the planet. So it might affect, it would affect the temperature of the planet. Um, for some of these planets, um, including the HD 189733b one that I mentioned, um, because we've got such good measurements of this planet, we've not only measured its spectrum in, in transit and in eclipse, we've actually measured um, a phase curve. So they've measured the light change in the system throughout the whole orbit of the planet, because it's a very short orbit, it's the order of days. And you can actually see as the planet comes round, um, just about to be eclipsed by the star, the total amount of light from the system is very, very slowly ramping up. And then it drops when the planet's eclipsed, and then it comes back up again, and then it goes down. That's because the side of the planet that's facing the star is a lot hotter than the side that isn't facing the star. The planet's actually what we call tidally locked. So the same side of the planet is always facing the star. So we can actually measure almost the temperature distribution of the planet, because we can see the hot side coming round, then it disappears, then it comes back again, and then you see the cold side. Yes? So yes, you can if you saw, you, there are some things that you can definitely see if they've got, for example, if you look at a very high spectral resolution at a water band and you see a water feature, you know it's water. You can be pretty confident you've seen water. The same would go for things like methane. You can, um, there are other methods actually that I didn't talk about that you can use to definitively detect um, specific gases. And if, you'd, if you want to ask me about it offline afterwards, then I'm happy to explain it, although it's probably too long to do it right now. But um, one of the biggest problems I mentioned before is degeneracy. If you've got quite coarse resolution spectra um, with quite big error bars, then often you can fit models with different compositions. You can fit lots of them, and they all look the same because of competing effects. Because um, a broad feature of, say, water plus some methane might look like a CO2 feature, or if the temperature is a bit different, that might look like a very different composition. So it is quite difficult, but there are ways, there are circumstances in which you could say, yes, I have seen water. And I think there are definitely some planets that we have detected water vapor. We have definitely detected methane, for example. I think we've got time for one more quick question. When, when I learned about how our planetary system evolved, you tend to learn that pretty much where they evolved, that's yeah. why they're rocking. Have you, have what you've discovered so far changed your views? Hugely. Views on um, oh, absolutely, yes. It's, it's not, um, I tend to, I look at individual planets and atmospheres, so it's not an area that I know a lot about, but obviously from attending conferences I've, I've heard talks about this. Um, one of the things that we think now is that a lot of these planets probably migrate, so they, they would start forming at one point in the disk and then through various tidal forces they'd be pushed inwards or outwards. Um, the hot Jupiters that are sitting really close to their stars almost certainly didn't form there. They would have been pushed in. And one of the other reasons we think that is you get a lot of these hot Jupiters that are on um, very highly inclined orbits. So if you look at the, the, the star in a lot of detail, you can often measure the rotation of the star. You know what direction it's in by looking at, um, if you have a transiting planet, it's an effect called, complicatedly, the rossiter mclaughlin effect. So as the star rotates, one side of it is a bit blue shifted, one side of it is a bit red shifted. And as the planet crosses, the, you can determine how inclined the orbit is relative to the star's rotation by looking at very, very, very subtle changes as the planet blocks out different bits of the star, different blue-shifted or red-shifted bits of the star. 
And a lot of these hot Jupiters have really highly, crazily inclined orbits, um, which implies that there was some quite dramatic disturbance um, from their formation to where they are right now. There's a lot of work going into studying these. Um, we still don't really know definitively how planets form. Past, um, we, we, know, we know how things get to a certain size. We know how things that are bigger become bigger. We, there's a huge gap in our understanding that we still don't really know. Um, I think this is certainly starting to help, having all of these other systems to study, but I think the accepted view of things when we, all we knew about was our own solar system is, is probably quite a long way away from what we really think happens now, because most of the systems we're seeing are completely different. Oh, um, if anyone does have any further questions, Jill will be here to um, answer some more for the next several hours, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you, Joe, for a wonderful talk. Thank you, the audience, for some wonderful questions. Thank you, Joe, for wonderful answers. Um, just to say to everyone, the next talk will be on Tuesday, the 4th of February, when Melissa George will be talking about her research into particle physics. Um, I wish everyone a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year and all the best for 2014. And I'd like to finish by thanking Joe once again for a wonderful talk this evening. Thank you. Very much. Thank you.